Hi, this is Margaret Maloney and welcome to the Death Dhamma Podcast. Together we will consider life, death, and impermanence. Because in between birth and death, we lose things. Not just our glasses and our keys. We lose identities, relationships, ideas, and more. But what we can gain right now is facing this together and we will gain freedom, peace, and progress on our path. Hello, my Death Dhamma community, and welcome. I thought we were in a good place here in season two to do some reflecting on the wonderful sharing and discussions that we have had up until this point. You see, right now, we are at a point in season two of the Death Dhamma podcast where we have had the opportunity to once again learn from 12 wise teachers. And I say it that way because last year in season one, season one was built all around interviews of 12 wise teachers and then lessons learned from those 12 wise teachers. And so in season two, I followed that model. In season one, those lessons culminated in the launch, you know, the publishing of my book, Sitting with Death, Buddhist Insights to Help You Face Your Fears and Live a Peaceful Life. Will these interviews culminate in a book? I don't know. That's something I can't say right now other than I do have plans on publishing something in 2023. We can probably take a safe guess that I'm going to discuss Buddhism and impermanence and death dhamma, but I'm certainly open to hearing from you about the kinds of things you would like me to bring to our discussions and what you would like to learn more about. So please feel free to send me your ideas for season three of this podcast and, you know, things that you would, topics you would like me to address. And you can send that to Info at margaretmaloney.com if you feel so inclined. That would be great. You can leave comments uh, on the podcast as well because it's already time to plan for season three. But we're not finished with season two yet. I just thought this was a really good time to reflect. And so some thoughts in kind of a specific order, but kind of not. First, a big reminder This is not easy for any of us. That was a theme in season one when we were really more targeting conversations around death and dying and grieving and the impermanence that we face, also not easy for us. And yeah, this season, we sometimes spoke specifically about death and sometimes we spoke about other kinds of impermanence. The idea being that we face impermanence all the time, and sometimes it can be the training ground for the, the big D, the death, and we're calling this season like the little D, because again, it wasn't specifically centered around death, but sometimes we did. So yeah, again, this is not easy for any of us. I don't think in any of the discussions, you know, if you remember some of them, or if you go back through and revisit some of them from January till now, that you're going to hear someone say to me, oh, Margaret, it's easy. Oh, impermanence is no big deal. Or I've never had a problem with it. It's never troubled me. Because that's not the experience for the majority of us sharing this planet, no matter where someone might be in their practice. And Many people have, you know, generously shared their time to speak with me and with me to you, right? I'm just the conduit. And none of these people are paid guests. They just graciously give their time to talk, which has been amazing, right? So impermanence is part of all of our lives. Or, you know, another way to say it is loss is universal. We're always going to lose something We're always going to be experiencing impermanence and we face it in different ways. We have different experiences in our lives. It could be that there's someone you meet with, you meet, you fall in love, you're convinced that you're going to get married and spend the rest of your life together. And then that's not what happens. It's not what happens. You break up, 
you move on, you have a different life with someone else. There could be the impermanence of planning on having a family and the loss of children not being born or losing our home or losing our job. I know I told you the story of that time that I lost my job, which at that point in my life was one of the hardest things I faced. And then I moved on with my life and wouldn't you know it, other more difficult situations presented themselves because that's very often how life goes. We heard of a story from Ratna Devi about how she was losing her hearing and how that was impacting her joy of music and of going to concerts, but it didn't end the experience. It changed the experience. So she had this experience of impermanence with her hearing, which led to impermanence in the way in which she enjoyed concerts, but she was able to learn to enjoy concerts absolutely again. We have had someone who has lost parts of his limbs and definitely has, I'll say, uh, a reduction in life expectancy. Now, none of us have a hard promised life expectancy. I mean, it's just the term is expectancy. And we do have some expectations based on maybe how long our parents and grandparents have lived our own health, what's going on. But, you know, sometimes something happens, like with Terry Tucker, where he had this, I'll say this odd thing on his foot. It was supposed to be a no big deal, weird kind of cyst. Well, it wasn't. It was a rare form of melanoma. And he lives in a constant space of when, when will be his last day. And he does it with so much grace and with the goal of helping others and as many people as he can while he is here, while being a loving husband and father. We have people who maybe became monastics. I can think of two examples and thought that was the life. And then that wasn't the life. But Buddhism was still very much important part of both of those people's lives and their practices, but living in a monastic type way wasn't quite right. So there was the impermanence, you know, the joining of the, um, for one becoming a monk, for the another becoming a nun. And then the impermanence of realizing like that wasn't quite the right path. Buddhism was the right way, just not living as a monk or a nun. So there were chains. We had Shelly say to us, Shelly Wright, when I was speaking to Shelly, I remember she just came out and said this thing. And, you know, it might be one of those obvious, do you ever have like what I, I call an obvious epiphany where something has been in front of you, but you didn't see it or hear it yet? And she said, we are all grieving something. And that was an obvious epiphany for me because I thought, She's right. I didn't think about it that way. But with all these different forms of impermanence that we face in our life, with change and having to let go of something, there is grief. It might be different forms of grief. It might be different depths of grief. But there is grief. And my gosh, if we're all grieving something... Why it, Why is it not normalized? I feel still, and this is part of why I, I stay and spend time with this topic of death, dhamma, and grief, and dying, and all of these things, and how Buddhism can help, is why don't we just normalize the fact that grief is a part of everyday life? We can expect feelings of grief to pop up just like we might get hungry, or sleepy, or laugh, or have a little bit of anger or frustration. It's just part of the makeup of being a human on this planet. Sometimes the things that were big, big deals in our lives, you know, like a minute ago, I was discussing with you the fact of like when I lost my job and how hard that was for me. And at the time, that was like one of the biggest things I ever faced, right? It was one of the most difficult biggest things for me to face. I was just wrecked by it. Um, spoiler alert, I come through 
as you know, because here I am and I'm fine. But at that time, it was just huge. And then to go through, you know, seeing my father through cancer and seeing my husband through cancer and having my mother and husband die within five days of each other and going through a couple of years where it seemed like, you know, every couple of months somebody was dying, which again, this is just how life works. There's nothing special about my situation. This is part of being a human on this planet. But in hindsight, that situation of losing my job seems smaller in comparison to losing people I loved. I'm not making light of the experience that I went through as I was losing the job because, as you know, it was very difficult. But now I can look at it with an appreciation for how that difficult situation taught me about accepting things that were outside of my control and learning to let go. And even though I wouldn't have thought of it as grief at the time, definitely I was going through the grief of the job and the people I worked with, that I, some of the people that I enjoyed, and the idea around what my career was going to be, right? But all of that prepared me for later things that were going to happen in my life. And so it was a lesson and a gift. Now, across all of our practices, you know, we all seem to benefit from some, I'll say, common practices. Despite the fact that I speak to people from many different Buddhist practices, and I believe that this season I also spoke to one or two people who wouldn't maybe classify themselves as Buddhists, but would say that they are, I'll say, friendly, friendly to Buddhism, all right? What we all seem to find helpful, perhaps in, I'll say, different dosages, but that we all find helpful, contemplation, you also may know that as meditation, art, either creating art or spending time with art, music, creating music, being around music, singing, playing an instrument, poetry, remember Sukima shared some beautiful poetry with us, some that was his own, some that he appreciated from other poets, and especially a poem that he wrote after he helped his granddaughter bury her pet hamster, which one of the parts I love about that poem is it kind of ends with, can we have a cuddle? Which just kind of shows you another thing we benefit from is community and caring. Sometimes we just need that cuddle. Sometimes we just need silence and somebody to sit next to us and hold our hand. We also tend to benefit from the beauty of nature and the beauty of other things and gratitude for the experiences in our lives. Again, community and then sometimes solitude. And I don't have a prescription pad where I can write you a prescription right now to say like, okay, take one hour of meditation and throw in an hour of music and a half hour walk in nature. It's really about us each finding the right blend. What is the right blend for us? And being open to the fact that each day is different Each day, the blend or the prescription, if you will, the dosage, might be a little bit different. It might be a half hour of meditation and an hour and a half walk on the beach or listening to music while you journal, which reminds me something else that is very helpful for us is self-reflection and self-awareness and self-compassion These are all things that will help me understand on any given day, where am I and which of these items are going to help me when I need help, right? Acceptance. Acceptance makes it easier. When I say acceptance makes it easier, what I specifically mean is acceptance of the situation, acceptance of the knowledge of impermanence, Acceptance helps us do away with clinging. 
because one of the challenges around impermanence is that as things change, because everything rises and everything ceases, when we experience dukkha or suffering, it is so much around the clinging and the aversion. I don't want to lose this job. I don't want to have to go find another job. I don't want to have to go start over somewhere new. I don't want to have cancer. I don't want my loved one to have cancer. Acceptance helps us with the suffering. When you and I can come to a place of acceptance, we can really master that clinging and aversion. I'm not saying it's easy. And uh, when I was recently speaking with Wendy Block, I liked how she was saying that, you know, on any given day, our ability to recognize and remember impermanence, because she said, you know, just remember, like repeat Anicca to yourself all day, throughout the day, you can't remind yourself of impermanence enough. And I really appreciate her sentiment there, her thoughts, because it it is true. And on any given day, I might be more open to whatever impermanence comes my way that day. And on some other days, I might be more locked down, like, no, I don't have time for this today. No, this can't be this way. And I don't get to dictate that. It's my karma that's going to dictate what happens, right? It is important to realize, though, that between the rising, let's say, of the impermanence and acceptance, there might be a gap. And what I mean by gap is a space of time where you or I are working on coming to that place of acceptance. Some people, depending on what has happened, can go right from, oh, the freeway's blocked. I'll just get off at this exit and take surface streets quickly. And some days we might come from a place of, what do you mean I have to take the next few days off and have lab work done and tests and scans done by the doctor? I'm busy. I don't have time for that. So there's a gap and it's important to recognize the gap and to be in the gap, to be with the gap. One of the best stories that was told to me that really helped teach me about the gap, because I think it was something that was, it might be another one of those, you know, obvious epiphanies. I think this was one where I hadn't really, it hadn't really fully come up for me yet. I hadn't vocalized this. Ratna Devi told the story of her friend who was learning that she had alopecia and she was going to lose all of her hair. And in that moment in the doctor's office, that friend kind of just said, oh, okay, as if she was ready to go all in on losing her hair. And her doctor stopped her and said to her, this is a big deal and you need to give yourself time to think about it. Not because she could control it or change it or stop her hair from falling out, but I think what her doctor was recognizing was that maybe she was being too Uh, glib to easily trying to move forward and to many of us losing our hair when we're not monastics and we don't shave our head on a regular basis, losing our hair can in fact be a big deal. Her doctor was saying in a way, there's a gap, right? So sit with it how long that's that was up to her what did she really need but it was really skillful of her doctor to say hey you know this is a big deal spend some time with this and we don't always just jump from impermanence has happened oh okay i'm fine with that we don't always do that again it depends on so many factors our practice where we are on that day what is the thing that has occurred So there is a gap and it is 
good to recognize and accept the gap and be with the gap. And what time, whatever time you need for your gap is whatever time you need for your gap, right? And we, we all help one another. And that's evident again by all of these people. So, you know, in season two, in season one, 12 wise teachers, in season two, 12 wise teachers coming to share their experiences with you and with me. And we help each other with an openness of the understanding that impermanence is difficult for all of us. We all might use similar approaches to deal with it, to navigate impermanence, but we don't do it in exactly the same way. My way of meditating isn't exactly the way a Zen Buddhist meditates, which isn't exactly the way a Tibetan Buddhist meditates, but we do. And we want to approach impermanence with openness and compassion for ourselves and for others. And those are just some of the reflections I have. And in sharing these reflections with you, I'm not telling you that season two is over. I'm just saying this is a good place. We've had 12 teachers. Let's look at some of the teachings. I hope that you will reach out and share some of your reflections. You can do it in the you know comments on your podcast site. You can send a note to info at margaretmaloney.com. And I especially want to hear your thoughts around our plans for season three, because I'm looking forward to journeying into season three with you on the Death Dhamma podcast. And for now, thank you so much for being here. You've been listening to the Death Dhamma podcast with your host, Margaret Maloney. Thank you so much for being here. Come find me on margaretmaloney.com, M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T-M-E-L-O-N-I.com. And until we meet again, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be at ease, and may you be free from suffering. Bye for now.